All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, being here, for spending your lunch here to learn about Sigfox. My name is Nick de Koeman. I'm IoT solution architect for In The Pocket. We are a mobile and IoT agency based in Ghent. So just to be clear, I am not working at Sigfox. I'm not involved in any of their activities. I'm just an early believer and I hope to make a believer from you as well by the end of this presentation. Let me get started with a simple question. The Internet of Things, we all know its definition. It's the fact that soon all devices near us will be connected, will be connected with each other, with the Internet. But the question I have is the following. How are these things going to be connected? Which technologies are we going to use to establish that all these devices are going to be connected? Connected to each other, connected to the internet. To answer this question, let's take one step back and see which solutions current IoT applications use. How is it that they achieve connectivity and what are their limitations? The first group of devices that we can identify is what they call smart home devices. Devices like the home, uh, the Nest thermostat, Philips Hue, and at the right you see the Luna smart mattress, which is a mattress capable of tracking your sleeping pattern. These devices, they're all situated in your home. They are connected to the electricity grid. So they don't really need, um, I mean, um, energy consumption is not really an issue here. And most likely, they are also not going to be moved around often. So these devices, they sit in your home, and the best way, obviously, to connect them is to have Wi-Fi connected. So all these devices here, they use Wi-Fi to connect to each other, to connect to the internet, and obviously, that makes a lot of sense. Second group of devices are the more portable things, things like a smartwatch or a wearable or an eye beacon or the style thing, which is some sort of activity tracker. Devices like this, these are categorized by the fact that they are compact. They run on usually a small battery, and so therefore for these, um, the power consumption for them is super, super important. Finally, most likely, they are also going to make use of short-range communication, and so therefore, for these devices, Bluetooth is best fit. Um, Bluetooth is being used just to broadcast the data all the way to your smartphone, and then your smartphone is going to take care of it himself. So up till now, we saw two distinct groups of devices. On the one hand, the smart devices with the Wi-Fi. On the other hand, more portable devices running on Bluetooth. Obviously, if you think about the Internet of Things, we can envision far more applications and devices. Devices like, for instance, your car that you want to lock and unlock remotely, or for instance, this smart trash can. The city of Brussels, for instance, bought 30 of them, and this trash can um, is capable of sending a notification when it is full and needs to be empty. So all these devices, they are quite different from the ones that we just saw. They are not inside your home, they're probably somewhere outside, and they do require strong connectivity, so they need to have direct access to the cloud. How does it solve today? Well, all these devices, they have actually a SIM card inside, so they use 3G and 4G to have connectivity today. But you feel that this is not ideal. I mean, um, 3G, 4G, it's, it's often quite expensive, especially for these use cases. They also rely on a local telecom provider and they're therefore not very scalable. So even though these solutions today make use of 3G, 4G to reach connectivity, this solution is not very ideal. So if you compare these different types of connectivity, you can basically see two groups of them. On the one hand, you have Wi-Fi, 4G, 3G. Both offer strong connectivity, meaning that they have direct access to the internet. 
data package that they can send are rich, so they can be videos, they can be photos, very rich data. But the, this implication is that they consume high power, so they, they have a high power consumption. On the other hand, you see Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is short-range communication. It's soft connectivity, so you don't reach the internet with it. But the data packages that are being sent with these, they are small, and therefore they only consume low power. So this is already OK for the, the, the groups that we just saw. But as I said before, if you think about all the devices that we will have in the Internet of Things era, everyday devices, then we see that both are not really ideal for us. We need like a combination. So what we exactly need is, is the following. On the one hand, we need strong connectivity. We need these devices to be directly connected to the Internet, so strong connectivity. Data packages, they can be small. Uh, we don't necessarily need to send videos and, and images, what we only want to send is small data like status updates or, or some sort of coordinates. That's, that's more than enough for these devices. And as these devices um, are usually not connected to the electricity grid, we want them to have low power consumption. So it's important that we reduce the energy consumption as much as possible. Meet Sigfox. Sigfox is a cellular network especially dedicated to connect things that we will see in the Internet of Things era. It offers strong connectivity, so it offers direct access to the Internet. It allows very tiny data packages to be sent. Power consumption is low, and for those reasons, Sigfox is significantly cheaper than um, other solutions than 3G and 4G, for instance. So this makes um, Sigfox ideal to um, connect everyday things to the internet. A little bit of background about Sigfox. Sigfox is a French-based company. It is based near Toulouse. It was already founded in 2009. It has 80 employees. And only the beginning of this year, it received a funding round, round of 150 million euros. To explain how this works, we go back to this uh, smart trash can. So in the other slide, this trash can, uh, we assumed that it used 3G, 4G to connect to the cloud. This is, let's say, trash can 2.0 that we um, use a Sigfox module for. So this trash can will notify that when it's full using Sigfox. And to do this, it needs to have a Sigfox ready module. And you have to see this um, like a Bluetooth module, for instance. Well, instead, now it needs to have a Sigfox module. This Sigfox module is capable of sending Sigfox messages. And each of these messages is automatically authenticated using a hashing mechanism, using a private key specific for each device. So. This device then emits these messages in the available frequency band. And then you have some Sigfox base station. And these base stations, they listen for all the Sigfox messages that they receive. And note that there is no negotiation necessary between the device and the Sigfox base station. So there's no handshaking. Message can simply be sent and received. So as soon as this base station receives the message, it will forward this message to the Sigfox cloud. So the base station is connected to the internet. The message is forwarded to the Sigfox cloud. And from there, it is being uh, pushed again to your dedicated cloud using HTTP callbacks, or Sigfox also provides an API, which you can then use to uh, retrieve your messages from. Once a message is in your cloud, you can obviously do whatever you want with it. You can um, react accordingly and, and process the message and show it in your application. So just it's very short to flow. You have a device having a Sigfox ready module. It sends messages that are being received by the Sigfox base stations. Sigfox base stations is connected to the internet. And from there, the message is being sent to your dedicated cloud. 
To give you an idea about these base stations, um, base stations can uh, receive one million messages a day. And for instance, to cover entire France, only 1,200 of these base stations were necessary. And this is in contrast to more than 50,000 stations to cover regular GSM solutions. So uh, the range is a lot longer, and that is due to the underlying technology that is being used for Sigfox. Some numbers. Um, as I said, Sigfox messages are tiny, tiny small. In fact, they only can carry 12 bytes of data. So 12 bytes is not a lot, so therefore it's definitely not intended for high bandwidth usage, like sending media or permanent broadcasting. But for many IoT applications, many everyday objects, this is more than enough. Also keep in mind that a timestamp and a unique device ID is already automatically sent, so it's not included in these 12 bytes, and so you don't have to uh, take care of this yourself. Sending a message takes about six seconds, and due to uh, mostly European regulations, um, a Sigfox-enabled device is only allowed to send six messages an hour. So if you take the total on a daily basis, that means that you can only send 140 messages a day per device. But again, for most IoT devices, for most everyday objects, this is more than enough. Sigfox communication is also bidirectional, so it means it goes in two ways. You can send a message from the device to your web service, but the web service can also push data back to the device. So it goes in both directions. Now, to make use of Sigfox, coverage is obviously required, so you have to have um, a base station nearby. These countries here are already fully covered, so we have France, Spain, uh, the Netherlands and more than 10 cities in the UK have full Sigfox coverage. And apart from these, you also have the city of Munich, Warsaw, Milan and Dublin that are also being covered. Currently being rolled out is Belgium. Um, it was announced earlier this year that Belgium would be covered by the end of this year. So any progress on this is probably going to be announced very soon. Other countries being rolled out are Italy, Portugal, uh, Luxembourg, and Denmark. And just two weeks ago or so, Sigfox announced that 10 cities in the United States will be covered, including San Francisco, by early 2016. So it is clear, Sigfox is being rolled out at a high pace. More and more cities are being covered. And it is sure that in two to three years, most of Western Europe and probably most large cities in the world will have Sigfox coverage. So with an increasing coverage, obviously more, uh, more uh, Sigfox-enabled products will arise. And I particularly like this product. It is um, called Stick and Track. It's uh, developed by a Belgium company, and it's basically sort of asset tracker using Sigfox to track your uh, device or your belongings. Um, the battery is set to last for 10 years because it uses Sigfox, which is very energy friendly. And um, it, it's only in pre-production phase, so it will get more sexy for sure. But uh, it, it's clear that solutions like this will become more and more important and will definitely make use of Sigfox for this. How to get started? Well, uh, it's very simple. Obviously, you need to be uh, in an area that has Sigfox coverage. You can then buy an Arduino Shield or a Raspberry Pi module like the ones up here. The first one, for instance, cost about 75 euros. And with this Shield, there also comes a subscription which allows you to use Sigfox for uh, one year. So it is very simple to get started. Um, visit definitely this website below, the Sigfox website. It's not very friendly, but this page definitely gives an nice overview on how to get started and which models you can buy. 
this brings me to the end. Um, as we said, the Internet of Things will make all the devices connected. On the one hand, we will see smart home devices that will benefit from our Wi-Fi network. On the other hand, we will have Bluetooth devices that will um, are short-range intended. But then other uh, devices, like, for instance, the smart trash can or your, your bike lock, for instance, these are devices that can definitely benefit from technology like Sigfox. Uh, coverage is growing rapidly. Um, you can buy modules to try them yourself. And if you have more questions, definitely don't hesitate to hit me up on Twitter. This was only a very brief introduction, so definitely keep your eyes on SafeVox and um, enjoy the rest of DevOps. Thank you very much.